Welcome to episode 139, Unraveling Damaging Assumptions, Critical Basics About Ageism and Intersectionality, featuring Dr. Regina Kep, licensed clinical psychologist. Make sure to subscribe to be alerted about future episodes by Clearly Clinical. Learn, grow, shine. Hello to our listeners. My name is Beth Irias, and today we're going to be talking about ageism and intersectionality, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Regina Kep. Uh, Dr. Regina Kep, she is a specialist uh, in geropsychology, and she's also the founder of the Center for Mental Health and Aging. She also runs her own podcast about uh, geropsychology and, and working in the mental health field with older adults. Uh, Regina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So why don't you take a minute and tell us about yourself and how you came to have this specialization in working with the geriatric population? Yeah, so I am a, from California. I was raised in California and then moved to Atlanta, where I live now, um, for a fellowship at Emory. And there I did a fellowship um, in HIV and uh, with African-American women who had made a suicide attempt and been a domestic violence relationship. I... Um, After that, I stayed in Atlanta and got a job at the Atlanta VA healthcare system. And I thought that working in trauma was the way I wanted to go. And I had the opportunity to work with older adults at a gero psychiatry outpatient clinic and um, in a gero, um, a geriatric primary care clinic. And so I did that for 10 years. Um, And during that time, I fell in love with working with older adults and um, really had an opportunity to see how few people were actually trained in working with older adults and then where the needs really lied in in working with older adults around the hospital. I think our mental health system was about 3,000 mental health providers and there was one small um, mental health clinic for older adults. It was myself as a psychologist, uh, 1.5 psychiatrists and two social workers. And in the veteran population, that's pretty startling because one in two veterans, I think, is 65 and older. So it's a disproportionately older population and with a tiny, tiny mental health care team that focused on aging. Of course, other mental health care teams were working with older adults, but our team was the only one who really specialized with older adults. And so over the 10 years that I was at the VA, I created a program called, um, it's called the Mental Health Gero Champions Program. And so my goal was to provide education to all the 3,000 mental health providers in the system who didn't have any training in working with older adults, but who were seeing older adults. And so, um, and so I would do workshops and provide consultation to um, those 3,000 mental health providers. And that just sort of kind of opened my eyes to seeing, you know, generally people are curious. They're like, how do we get this information? We're realizing we don't know as, as much about older adults or how to treat older adults, what's normal with aging, what's not normal with aging. Like help, you know, people were hungry for knowledge and information and, um, and they just didn't know where to get it. And so I created this Gero Champions program, and that was very exciting. And then I left the VA during the pandemic because I have little kids. And then I um, I launched the Center for Mental Health and Aging. And the goal there is to continue to kind of spread education and information about uh, mental health for older adults, like what's normal with aging in terms of normal brain health, nor, or typical, I should say, what's typical with aging in terms of typical brain health, um, typical mental health, and when should we be concerned, and then how effective are treatments. And I really wanted to get information into mental health providers' hands in order to improve access to mental health for older adults. You had a bit of a meandering path, but landed somewhere that I know from our conversations and even from how you talk about it, that you're really passionate about the um, idea of access to care and activism against ageism. Can we start just by talking about what does it mean to be a quote unquote older adult? What does geriatric population mean? How is this considered in our country and maybe even in different states or in the literature? Like how, how do you define it now that you've worked in this field for such a long time? 
Yeah. So, so in terms of population demographics, older adult has been 65 and older. Um, that is shifting a little bit since the retirement age. I think that had been set based on the retirement age in terms of when you can draw social security retirement without penalty. Now I think it's moving to 67. There are researchers in the field of gero psychology who um, think 65 is very young, which I do too. And then we'll say, well, we're only going to work with or see people or research 75 and older and so on. Um, geriatric care and syndromes Actually, some of them don't require any age re uh, at all. So people with dementia, um, you can have a dementia disorder and not be 65 and older. Um, you can have a dementia disorder and be much younger. But that is dementia is considered a geriatric syndrome. And so then you might be treated in a, a geriatric medical or mental health clinic if you have a sort of geriatric syndrome. Um I, I will say that um, older, so there, even though it was a meandering path around activism and all of that, um, the uh, older adults are actually the most diverse age group in the United States. So in terms of racial and ethnic identity, in terms of disability factors, in terms of um, spiritual factors, and, you know, all of the the diversity identities, LGBTQIA plus identities. So older adults have hold diversity, uh, you know, just in terms of that age group too. So young people become old people and we bring our identities with us. And, um, one of the common stereotypes about older adults is that older adults are all alike when in fact, older adults are incredibly diverse. Um, th does that answer your question about what, what constitutes geriatric? It does. Thank you. So with that in mind, can you speak about ageism and really offer a definition of ageism and how you see it play out. And obviously our whole conversation today is with ageism as a backbone, but let's start with kind of ageism 101 for people who haven't necessarily even considered this phenomenon. So according to the American Psychological Association Committee on Aging, I'm going to read you their definition of ageism. And then I want to give you actually kind of three ways that ageism plays out. So the definition from the American Psychological Association Committee on Aging is that ageism is stereotyping and discrimination against individuals or groups based on their age. It can include prejudicial attitudes, discriminatory practices, or institutional policies and practices that perpetuate stereotypical beliefs. So ageism can affect young people and old people. Ageism um, disproportionately affects older adults, but um, and I have some some thoughts about how that works in a minute in terms of, you know, the age identity is on a continuum. We're constantly aging, right? In the course of this interview, we both aged, um, but ageism can kind of have a um, kind of rears in young adulthood. And then you, you experience some ageism as you're developing in a new career and you're young or you're just out of high school or going into college or out of college and looking for a job or not going to college. Like however it is for you, you might be experiencing ageism in young adulthood and some discrimination based on, well, you're not capable of doing that yet and so on. But then what happens is then you age into, you age out of that and into a privileged identity with age. So I'm 45. I'm in a pretty privileged place with age. I can, I don't get discriminated against um, in terms of living. Like people assume I'm at a place in my career where I make enough money where I can afford my housing. When you're a young adult, you might experience housing discrimination. And when you're an older adult, you experience housing discrimination. Um, or workplace discrimination. So, um, so I'm 45. I'm not experiencing workplace discrimination or housing discrimination based on my age. Um, and so you, you might experience ageism when you're a young adult and then, and then age into a privileged age, age group. And then as you age, you know, it doesn't just start when you're 65. 
I'm, I'm experiencing more and more internalized ageism as I'm 45. I, I'm thinking, oh, my body's changing. It's never going to go back. I'm never going <laughs> to, like, I'm constantly thinking that. Or I'm thinking, like, do I want to apply, you know, if I, I'm thinking about work, do I want to work for myself or do I want to work for somebody else? If I work for somebody else, are they going to see me as, okay, well, she only has a few of these years left. And and so that's those messages are just starting to, to seep into my brain about myself. And I'm 45, but, the, but I'm not experiencing, um, so it doesn't just like start at 65, the ageism, it actually gradually happens over time as we approach older adulthood. And then in older adulthood, there's even more ageism where people conflate uh, ability with a person's age. And then there's lots of ableism and ageism intersecting. Out of curiosity, how does gender factor into this when we see, I mean, the first example I'm thinking of is ageism in Hollywood, for example, of the phenomenon of how much women or female identifying people are being paid versus how much men or male identifying people are being paid and just the opportunities um, and the perception of attractiveness, like all of these things are just so heavily gender-based. How, how do you see that play out in relation to ageism? One of the areas that I'm very passionate about is in the um, sexual expression in aging and sexual expression in the context of a dementia disorder. And so um, what we see what we do see around sexual expression and gender is that, um, you know, we have all of these stereotypes about women and men as, as we age, cisgender women and men as, as they age and we age, you know, what it me what, what is acceptable in terms of, um, sexual expression. So are you, if you're an older cisgender woman, are you, is it acceptable for you to be dating somebody 10 years younger than you? Or are you seen as a cougar, right? And where you're not even human anymore, you're, you're equated to animal, right? A cougar is an animal. Or, um, or are you seen as um, a floozy or like whatever these other sort of terms are? Or if you're um, a, a cisgender man and are sexual, you know, interested in intimacy and sexuality. There are all these other terms like a dirty old man. And, but in terms of gender, women do, ex so the, the intersection between gender and ageism is real. So there are actually more women who are older adults. I think there's something like, I actually have the statistics on that. There's something like, um, um, 56, percent of people 65 and older are cisgender women and 66 percent of people 85 and older are cisgender women and um and men and women both experience ageism and research shows that women actually experience more ageism than men do cisgender women there are also um of course, we know that uh, transgender men and women and non-binary and non-conforming folks also experience very high rates of discrimination, especially in, in older adulthood, too. And there are resilience factors, though, that are important as we talk about um, LGBTQ folks. Great. Thank you. And I, I appreciate that part of your career is evaluating these intersections and this consideration of multiple identities, multiple marginalized identities, and how those things are changing. And And I appreciate that point, too, of the, this idea of a sweet spot of privilege in between certain years, and then the degradation of that as we age that is is sometimes different than for other marginalized identities that, you know, were born this way, um, or that something happens and we acquire a marginalized identity, for example. But thank you for that explanation of going kind of in and out of the stages. So when we're talking about ageism, you mentioned kind of three factors that that uh, how ageism plays out. Can you speak to that? One of those factors, so it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what the three are, and then I'm going to give examples. So one is hostile ageism. The second is neglectful ageism. And the third is benevolent ageism. So hostile ageism is, you know, what we think of when we think of like hostility. So it's like the most overt type. It can be in the form of physical, financial, or verbal abuse. Um, it's also kind of implicated in this perception that older adults are a drain on society. So there used to be a term that people would use. And at one point, um, I myself thought it was funny. 
And then I looked deeper and I felt ashamed that I thought it was funny. But so there's a term called silver tsunami. And that's this, um, I think it's a metaphor for older adults flooding society. So baby boomers, the baby boomers, 10,000 people um, in the baby boom population, uh, 10,000 people, I think, turn 65 every day from 2011 to 2030. That's the baby boom population. And that means that by 2034, there will be more adults 65 and older than children under the age of 18. And that phenomenon of baby boomers moving into the older adult population, people were calling the silver tsunami. And because the the thought was, the the joke was that uh, older adults or baby boomers are flooding society and going to just destroy our resources. And, and that's incredibly hostile because it's saying then you're a drain on society. You're causing this flood. You know, they didn't ask to be born. It's like a phenomenon that happened in, in society. So, um, and, and it's not true because older adults continue to contribute to society. So, um, so that's an interesting sort of hostile ageism example this term of silver tsunami. So we don't use that term because it actually is quite ageist because it's evoking um, this stereotype that older adults are depleting our, all of our resources and causing harm. And then neglectful ageism is an ageism that overlooks the contributions that older adults are making actually in society. So like during the pandemic, Many of the older adults in my community, one of my best friends who retired just before the pandemic started, somehow she knew in her crystal ball that the pandemic, the pandemic was coming. But um, she retired and then started to take care of one of her grandchildren. And other older adults were stepping in and taking care of grandchildren. And so there's a contribution that that's one example of a contribution that older adults are making. We don't, in my family, we don't have that option or opportunity. We just had to be with our kids during the pandemic. Um, it was very challenging. But, um, but Older adults are making other other contributions as well in terms of volunteer hours. I remember um, I was volunteering at a hospital when I was 18, and there was an 80-something-year-old woman who was volunteering also, and she, she was showing me the ropes. And she took me around the hospital. She took me to the cafeteria where I would get food. And I remember she was chatting with another friend of hers, and she was saying, they asked me to spend another day a week in the NICU. I don't have time for that. I'm like dating. I have things on my plate. Like I don't have time for another volunteer day in the NICU. I mean, I like babies, but not, you know, I don't want to spend all my time here. And so I remember at 18 when I heard her having this conversation with a friend thinking, oh, that really just bounced the stereotype that I had about older adults on its head because this is a woman who's in her mid 80s. I think she was in her mid 80s, who's thriving and living a very eventful life and contributing. So neglectful ageism would, it kind of makes older adults invisible, doesn't look at the contributions that they're making to society. And then the third is benevolent ageism. And this one showed up a lot during COVID. And so benevolent ageism is a on one hand, very compassionate, and on the other hand, very paternalistic. It's a point of view that groups older adults together in one frail, like needy, requiring assistance group. And like they need, they need our protection. And so I was working with somebody in a mental health clinic, a staff member in a mental health clinic, who said, oh, to, to an older colleague, don't do that so early in the morning, I want you to be safe, like, or don't go into that neighborhood, I want you to be safe, like this, this um, older adult does outreach or something in the community. And the older adult said, No, I'm fine, I can take care of myself, I can make my decisions here. But during COVID, what was happening is that um, people were saying, Okay, older adults need to isolate, because they're the most vulnerable, physically vulnerable. And so actually every day I would be driving to work and I would drive under a freeway sign that said, coronavirus, isolate the elderly. And it actually said that on the freeway for months. And eventually the sign changed and it, it turned to coronavirus, protect the vulnerable, which is great. I'm okay with that. But isolating the elderly, I was not okay with. And, and, and that's benevolent ageism. On one hand, Yes, we know that older adults had a greater physical vulnerability to COVID. On the other hand, older adults can also decide 
by and large, where they how, how much risk they want to take. And we don't have to isolate people to protect them. Those three categories of hostile, neglectful, and benevolent, where are those coming from? So knowing that this is something you've studied extensively, how did those come to be? Do you agree with those classifications? Is there anything else that you would add or change? I'm curious, you know, as you see this play out in your career. Yeah, so those um, were from a, a two public health researchers from, I think they were from Cornell, um, Amini and Levy. There's another big ageism researcher, Levy. She, she actually identifies a couple of other aspects of ageism, which is like how ageism um, gets internalized in ourselves and in systems. So there's like a structural ageism that plays out in systems, and then there's internalized ageism that plays out in our own thinking and decision making. And, and how that plays out for older adults is sometimes like, well, why would I take medicine? I'm going to die anyway. Or like why, and, and the person's not terminal. The person has like long-term congestive heart failure. <laughs> why, why do I need to take antidepressant medication? I'm just going to be depressed anyway because I'm old. That's internalized ageism. Um, so, so there are other, there's internalized ageism that can happen. And then, um, and that creates this sort of like stereotype threat inside the person. And then there's, um, structural ageism that happens. Of course, you know, these are just three types of ageism that are easy to, to capture and categorize. But commonly, you, you know, then there's other, there are other stereotypes, which we were talking about earlier in terms of sexual stereotypes. And then there are stereotypes about that conflate aging with disability. And or um, or then there's a lot of ableism among people who are living with conditions um, that have limitations that come with them. Like a lot of people living with dementia. When we think about people living with dementia, we think automatically that they're incapable. When a lot of people living with dementia, you know, dementia is a very long illness. And, and over the arc of that illness, people often lose capacity, but in bits and pieces. And so it's not all at once, all of a sudden you have capacity, you know, you're capable and then you're not. And so then there, all of this sort of ableism plays out in the context of, of conditions that disproportionately affect older adults too. Of course, younger people experience ableism, but in terms of conflating um, age and, and ableism or ageism and ableism, that's very common. Got it. Thank you. To jump back, and I know this would be its own separate whole course that we'll be having conversation about, but to jump back to this idea of ageism and intersectionality, you know, we talked a little bit about gender. I know one of the populations you're really passionate about is working with the queer community. How, when we're considering and um, conceptualizing ageism in relation to other identities, can you speak to some of the other considerations when we're looking at ethnic, racial, cultural factors, socioeconomic status? Um, how, how do all of these things kind of play out? And again, like with the preface that this is a whole different conversation, but to tie that up in a pretty little box with a pretty little bow, kind of what, what are your takeaways of this consideration for clinicians? In terms of intersecting with other identity variables like uh, racial and ethnic identity and so on. Well, I will say, I know I gave some statistics about um, about women and aging, like the percentage of women who are um, older. I have some demographics about um, racial and ethnic identity aging, and I think that will be helpful in this conversation. I will say I'm not an expert on all um, all identities everywhere, but, um, but in terms of demographic factors, by 2030, older white people uh, will increase by 39%. And by 2030, older racial and ethnic minority populations will increase by 89%. So older white populations by 39% and older racial and ethnic populations by 89%. And that's just in terms of population growth. The um, And then I have a breakdown, 112% for Latinx and Hispanic communities, 81% for AAPI communities, 73% for African American communities and 72% for American, Indian, and Native Alaskans, um, or Native American and Native Alaskans. The, um, one of my areas in terms of clinical work is, is predominantly has been with older African American families. One of the, um, just by nature of, of 
um, the systems that I have worked in for the past decade um, have largely served uh, African-American families. And um, what we know about health disparities for older African-Americans is older African-Americans are two to three times more likely to have a dementia disorder and less likely to be informed and educated about it by their providers. And so there are, and, and then there are other um, pretty um, oppressive, uh, there are other statistics that highlight the oppression that African-Americans have experienced related to cancer diagnosis, related to heart disease, related to diabetes, and, and so on. So we know that the um, it's not only ageism, but it's the toll of race-based stress and trauma over the lifespan that culminates and creates this system called weathering, sort of um, having such high levels of cortisol in our system for such at chronic levels for a long time increases our risk for illness. And so um, we see this then, the culmination of all of this stress and trauma in older adulthood. It's not only how it's carried in the body, though, how that stress and trauma is carried in the body. It's also, we know, bias and discrimination in the healthcare systems and mental health care systems um, themselves, which is why it's so important that we have anti-bias work and that we do anti-bias work um, continually as mental health providers because um, our biases come out in our cells, <laughs> come out in our body language. So even if we're saying everything right, people still pick up on if there's bias happening in the exchange in the relationship. And so um, this is why sort of anti-bias work is so important. In terms of, um, so that's a little bit about African-American older adults. Lat Latinx and Hispanic folks also have a higher risk for dementia disorders than white Americans. And um, I don't exactly know all the statistics for each of the groups, but I know that it's more than, it's, it's kind of close or bumping up against African-American risk. And then I don't know specifically, I know AAPI folks have lower risk, not than white. I think it's just like one percentage point greater than white folks. Um, and But the highest risk are African-American folks. Compared to non-LGTBQ folks, LGTBQ folks tend to be more concerned about having enough money as they age. And, and that's attributed to workplace discrimination in terms of you know, career building and, and those sorts of things. Um, more concerned about experiencing loneliness, more concerned about declining physical health, because when we have declining physical health, we often need somebody to help care for us and or um, maybe worry like who will step in and do this, um, not being able to care for oneself and not having anyone to care for them. And then if we think about, you know, going into the health system and advocating for oneself. So even cisgender people who are in their medical providers' offices talking about sexual health, the majority of the time sexual health is brought up from older adults, uh, the older adults are bringing it up, not the healthcare provider. And um, I had an interview on my podcast last year, but and she's great. So I would highly recommend any opportunities for people to, to read anything from Laurie Cook Daniels. Laurie Cook Daniels is an expert on transgender aging. She founded the Transgender Aging Network and, um, and has great materials for uh, people living in a, and, you know, with loving somebody who's transgender or being transgender or non binary or non conforming. Great resources for like senior care communities, how to be more affirming for senior care communities how senior care communities can be more affirming to LGBTQ folks, but specifically transgender and gender nonconforming folks. Um, she also writes like, has some great recommendations for if you're asking questions to know and tell why, like know why you're asking the question. There are a lot of gratuitous questions that transgender folks receive by healthcare and mental health providers. So know why you're asking the question and then tell the person, like, I'm going to be asking you about all of the medications that you take, even hormone uh, affirming medications, because that might, inter I, I need to assess if that's going to interfere with other medications that you're taking. So you tell the person, I'm going to ask you about all of your medications because medications might interfere, even hormone affirming medications, so I can see if they interfere with health conditions or 
um, or other medications. So um, Lori, when I was talking with her, gave me a great example of um, her partner went in for a common cold. And then the doctor asked about something about trans- transitioning or, or uh, affirming surgery or something that had nothing to do with the common cold. It was just a gratuitous curiosity. And so she, uh, any work that she does, and I can give a link that if you're interested, I can, uh, you can connect um, with the Transgender Aging Network and then with Forge, which is a national nonprofit for LGBTQ folks. And then she kind of spearheads some programs for them and then and focuses on aging. So that's really, her work is really helpful. I know I kind of got off on that. I will say, though, that um, older, I know I gave some pretty harsh statistics about older African-American folks and also some pretty harsh statistics about older LGBTQ folks in terms of um, risk for illness. Older LGBTQ folks also have a higher risk for a dementia disorder. Um, But I will say both of those groups, and these groups I just know well, African-American and uh, LGBTQ groups, um, both groups have high, high rates of resilience over the, in older adulthood as well. So when we look at um, suicide rates for older African-Americans, they're some of the lowest, where older white men have the highest suicide rate. African-American folks have some of the lowest suicide rates. Older folks, I should say. Um, LGBTQ folks, there was a study done that looked at um, older adult, older LGBTQ veterans versus younger LGBTQ veterans. And what the researchers found was that older LGBTQ veterans were more resilient over stressors that impact mental health, that they experienced less alcohol use and reported less minority stress, and that their LGBT identity was more central to the older veterans' overall identity. And in that study, the the researchers thought that the life... Or they believed that the lifetime challenges of being a sexual minority may have prepared LGBTQ veterans, um, older veterans with better coping and then better adjustment in the face of some age-related transitions and stressors, which was pretty interesting. And the same is true for older African-American folks in, in, in the literature as well. Thank you for sharing that. And I also know in relation to the pandemic that older adults actually fared better than other age groups in their display of resilience and their ratings of overall life satisfaction. Can you speak to that a little bit and kind of how you've seen that phenomenon play out? Yeah. So the CDC actually did a study on who was experiencing like the most depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, substance use, uh, post-traumatic stressors or post-traumatic stress. And it actually uh, turned out to be pretty correlated with age but negatively correlated with age. So the people who experience the highest rates of depression, anxiety, substance use, suicidal thought, post-traumatic stress were young adults, like 16 to 24. And then the older the sample got, the older we got in society, the less symptomatic we were. So older adults, and this, these are community dwelling older adults, meaning not older adults with dementia, but dementia is not a normal part of aging. So we can just throw that out there. Um, So, um, and these are people who are living in the community. So not in like a a nursing home or a long-term care community. So um, community dwelling older adults had the lowest rates of depression, anxiety, substance use, and suicidal thoughts during COVID compared to any other age groups. To talk a little bit more about dementia I think one of the stereotypes out there, and you, of course, can speak to this more, is the idea that older adulthood invariably includes someone, quote unquote, you know, losing their mind, losing their memory, like losing pieces of their identity, forgetting who people are, things like that. Can you speak to the reality of that and how common something like Alzheimer's or dementia actually is? Yeah. So I think some of the most recent studies, so every year the Alzheimer's Association comes out with a report. The last report I read was either 2020 or 2019. It was one in nine older adults, 65 and older, experiences a dementia disorder. So um, it might also help to say um, dementia is like an umbrella. And underneath that um, dementia umbrella are different types of dementia disorders. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. Vascular disease is another. Parkinson's uh, dementia, it's not vascular disease, it's vascular dementia. 
Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body dementia. Those are all dementia disorders under the umbrella of dementia. In terms of age and dementia, our risk for dementia does increase as we age. And it's more commonly seen in older adulthood, but people under 65 can also have dementia. There are more more and more researchers are finding that actually dementia starts much earlier in life than we thought and just sort of under the surface. And we can do a lot to um, shape our risk for dementia, even if we have the dementia or Alzheimer's gene. And I could talk about that because some of the research actually looks at ageism and dementia. So um, uh, there's a huge researcher, her name is Becca Levy, L-E-V-Y, out of Yale, and she also works with the uh, World Health Organization. And she's huge. I would love, I'm like, I'm like a groupie for Becca Levy. (laughs) So um, she actually did some research on uh, ageism being linked to Alzheimer's disease. And what she found was that in groups with greater negative age stereotypes, the rate of, okay, I'm going to back up for a second and explain when people have Alzheimer's disease, and this is important for the the statistics, um, there are actually physiological changes happening in the brain. Some of those are with the tau protein and some are with neurofibrillary tangles. And so That's relevant to what's happening in this research that I'm about to share with you. Um, But so when, when there are neurofibrillary tangles creating lesions kind of in the brain and tau protein and these tangles sort of work together um, and that creates impairment and actually a brain with dementia over time actually gets smaller. There's a process of, you know, entanglements and demyelination and lots of stuff happen. I'm not a neuroscientist. This is my very crude (laughs) example, but, but, um, But that's how dementia or Alzheimer's disease works. And it creates impairment. And it's not just impairment in memory. It's impairment in language and impairment in functioning, impairment in judgment. Um, People say that dementia is a memory disease. Memory is one aspect of the disease. So it it creates all sorts of, um, it can and often you know, over the disease course creates lots of impairment all the way to, to the brain not knowing how to eat and swallow and, um, and manage toileting and things like that. But so Becca Levy's research looking at ageism and Alzheimer's disease found that in groups with greater negative age stereotypes, so people who have negative age stereotypes, the rate of hippocampal volume decline that's where the memory is stored in the hippocampus, was three times the rate of decline in the positive age group. So for people who had negative age beliefs or stereotypes, their uh, hippo volume decline was three times the rate of decline in the positive age stereotype group. And then there was a significantly greater accumulation of plaques and tangles in the brain too when you had negative age stereotypes which is incredible. So that's just our beliefs about aging. The other, she did another study looking at people with the Alzheimer's gene, which is called the APOE4 gene, and found that those with positive age beliefs were close to 50% less likely to develop dementia than those with negative age beliefs, even when you had the Alzheimer's gene. Our beliefs about um what aging looks like, what we can expect in our older adulthood are so significant. And it wasn't just Alzheimer's. She found it with like cardiovascular disease too. If we have negative beliefs, we're more likely at when we're 30 years old and we have negative beliefs about aging, we're more likely to have our heart attack by the time we're in our 60s. That's remarkable um, research. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it segues in perfectly into my next question, which is going to be about the mental health needs for older adults. But to recap what you just said, basically, when when adults and older adults hold negative beliefs about aging, they're more likely to experience both uh, medical and mental health consequences that affect longevity and overall health as they age. That's eerie. <laughs> like, there's something really, there's a challenge there I heard for mental health providers, uh, but that opens up a whole nother issue about access to care, which I know you're going to talk about as part of our interview. Yeah. But also, um, that's, it's so profound what you just said. Yeah. And thanks to Becca Levy and her group for doing this important work, because it's really shaping how we can educate and talk about 
how what we believe about people matters, about aging. And and really, um, I had an interview uh, several months ago. I, I met with Ashton Applewhite, who's a big uh, anti-ageism activist, pro-aging activist. She wrote a book called This Chair Rocks, and it's a great book about um, ageism and the toll of ageism. She's not a, a psychologist or anything. She's a writer and author, and she, she wrote a great book about ageism. But um, she was talking about, you know, the ageism is so harmful, one, because it's harming other people if we're not, and it's harming ourselves, and it's harming our future self. So if we have negative beliefs about aging and we're in our 30s, and Becca Levy's research shows, then we're more likely to have a heart attack when we're in our 60s. That's a big deal. Becca Levy's research also showed that people with a positive view of aging live seven and a half years longer than people with a negative view of aging to your point about longevity. But in terms of access to mental health care, so this is really where my passion lies. So about 20 to 22% of older adults have a mental health condition like depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, um, dementia disorders. So dementia is a medical condition that has psychiatric features. So we, we often see it in mental health care. Um, it's also in the DSM. So um, so it's a it's a psychiatric condition, but it's it's a medical condition. People die. It's I think Alzheimer's disease is the fifth leading cause of death in people over sixty five or something, or the sixth leading. It's it's up there. Um, so people, it's a terminal, a chronic and terminal illness for people if they have Alzheimer's disease. So um, so twenty to twenty two percent of older adults have a mental health condition, and what's startling is that more than 60, like 67% of them are not getting any mental health care. And there are researchers look at why, like, why is that happening? Why are older adults not getting the mental health care that they need? And some of the reasons are around access to care. Like are mental health providers even trained or, or even healthcare providers are undertrained as well in identifying what mental health looks like, mental health conditions look like in older adulthood. We have all sorts of stereotypes and stigma, and older adults hold the stigma too about mental health care. Um, and stereotypes like, well, of course you're depressed, you're old, right? Of course you're anxious. Of course you have dementia, like, of course you're losing your memory. You're old, but Depression is not a normal part of aging. Anxiety is not a normal part of aging. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. And so what happens if we think it's normal with aging, we're not going to be concerned and say, actually, there's treatment for the suffering that you're experiencing. And research shows that the treatment for depression in older adults is just as effective for treatment in younger adulthood. Like older adults benefit at the same rates. And, and then we have all these stereotypes like old dogs can't learn new tricks, right? So uh, what can I do with them? And I would hear this a lot from mental health providers. Well, what can I do with them in therapy? I mean, they're not going to change. And that's wrong, actually, that um, older people, just like younger people, can you know, change is hard and people do it. So collectively, when we're thinking of the mental health needs and again, this cumulative phenomenon of all the other pieces that you were talking about, you just mentioned this idea of ageism in therapy, which just came up in what you said of, of like, well, I don't really know what to do with them. And, and this is this is just part of aging. You're going to be sad. You're going to be scared. How do we clinicians not do that, not perpetuate this phenomenon? And what are the big um, red flags that you've seen and heard in your work that make you wince and go, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, one, I think, is to know what the real toll is. So if, so, you know, one is to develop your own awareness and knowledge and skills, just like you would do for any other um, identity that you're working with. So if you're, work, if, if you're working with um, LGBTQ folks, if you're working with African-American folks, if you're working with Native American folks, you're, you really want to be developing your awareness, knowledge, and skills about people so they don't have to all, also educate you about who, you know, the, the toll of race-based trauma or the toll of, um, of homophobia right? Or transphobia, like people shouldn't have to educate you about the toll of these things. So you really do need to develop awareness, knowledge and skills. So what that means with older adults is that 
you need to know. So older adults actually are highly resilient and we know that. And there was all uh, some great research during the pandemic that actually identified what older adults were doing that in terms of breaking down their resilience factors that we could all benefit from. We could benefit from what they were doing because we needed the resilience too and still do. But so even though older adults are resilient, when they do experience depression, it actually um, has significant effects for their livelihood. So when older adults experience depression and don't get the mental health care that they need or anxiety and don't get the mental health care that they need, their medical problems get worse. They have more frequent visits to the ER. They have longer stays in the hospital. They require more medication, which means more costly, right? It's more expensive. They have greater um, caregiver stress. So the people who are helping to care for them and love them have a higher rate of stress and strain in the relationship. They have poorer quality of life and their risk for suicide goes up. And we know, so suicide is interesting. I know I, I mentioned earlier, um, there are some interesting intersections for older men with suicide. So older white men, 85 and older, have the highest rate of suicide. And we know then if, de if depression is not treated, all of these other things happen. And so even though older adults are resilient, when they do have depression, we need to help them get treated because it has significant impact on health and well-being for them and their family. And then society, because caregivers, I think something like 67% of caregivers are women and the average age of a caregiver is 49 and she's working. And so, and she's in the sandwich. She has kids. She has aging. She's trying to work. So that impacts her and then her children. Like lots of, lots of people are affected and the society is affected. So that's one is that one is just to develop your awareness that, uh, that depression is treatable. Anxiety is treatable. Insomnia is treatable. Substance use disorders are treatable and older adults, just like everybody else. And then that there are resilience factors that you can draw on. And, and that's really important because the, what some of the research was talking about in terms of the resilience factors during COVID, let me just pull it up and share some of them with you. Um, some of the factors were that people, older adults tended to focus on quality, not quantity in relationships, that they would tap into their wisdom, but, um, and wisdom was broken down into multiple pieces and it was particularly self-compassion. Uh, they practiced mind, they tended to practice mindfulness and it didn't have to be like meditation. Uh, and then, and then managed a, like maintained a routine and hobbies and work, work, um, like maybe volunteer work, if, even if they didn't have to see somebody in person or family and friends, just the, the basics of a routine and reaching out for like social support from peers. So back to the quality, not the quantity of relationship, which was uh, what older adults were proving to do during the pandemic. But the other thing that clinicians can do is to give a message of hope. So older adults receive ageist messages and have been their whole life, right? So they might also have these messages inside of them that, um, well, it's normal to be depressed when you're older. Like, can I really expect to get better from this? And what's the point if I'm, you know, on my way out of this world? And so I think as mental health providers, part of developing your own awareness is to also share a message and be clear about hope, and what is possible for, for people in older adulthood. And yes, healing is possible and treatment for depression is possible and treatment for complex grief is possible and you can be feeling better. Yesterday, somebody reached out to me um, and this was an older person and, um, and I sh shared with her, please, she was on the fence about, she was gonna think about whether or not she wanted to do mental health care. And I said, please no. She said, I just want to feel better. And I said, yes, that is possible. And it's so probable. And you, we can help you do that. And the, um, so I think sharing a message of hope is really important about the benefits of mental health care. I also think mental health providers um, can engage in perspective taking. So um, just to kind of imagine who you're in connection with, who's an older person and take their perspective. What is it like to have so many lived experiences and life experiences? I know um, sometimes 
I, um, I have stereotypes about older white people like that they're going to have a certain system of beliefs that are really going to conflict with my system of beliefs in terms of um, uh, social justice or anti-racism work. And and I'll have to engage in perspective taking and remember like, oh, okay, I, I'm going to be an older adult someday. And I have this system of belief. Or the Freedom Riders from like the 1950s with the Rosa Parks bus movement, the um, bus boycott from Jackson, Mississippi, along the bus line, those people were freedom riders. And I have um, uh, a poster of all the mugshots of those people who were arrested during the freedom rides. And it was like half and half black people and white people. And I have to remember, like, those people are older adults. Or what is it like to have a new uh, medical condition where you can't walk or you're incontinent? Like, imagine what it's like to be in that person's shoes. And imagine also all of your history that would help you uh, work through that and come out on the other side in terms of resilience. I know for me, um, when I'm working with a lot of um, very ill older adults at a very specific place in their life in terms of illness and and impairments and capacity or um, end of life, I have to, um, that becomes a very narrow frame of focus like I, it's just people who are sick and dying. And I have to remember, this is not every older adult. This is not the majority of older adults. And like, like I kind of get very zoomed in sometimes and my field of focus gets very narrow. And I have to remind myself like to broaden my lens and look out and shift my focus to other older adults who are thriving and just typical in the community. Because otherwise I get the line of work that I do, which is people who are very medically ill or have done with people who are medically ill. It gets very narrow in terms of the specific experience in life about significant illness. And I have to remind myself, like, this is not all older adults. This is one specific experience. And so um, I think it's also helpful to just counter the stereotypes that we have, like, do some reality checking. How true is this? And don't only look for, for examples that confirm the stereotype. Look for examples that refute the stereotype, like a counter stereotype. I think that's so helpful. And then, and then I would encourage people to, to be open to having your biases and assumptions shattered and just allowing the person to reveal who they are and all of their gifts and, um, and, and, to be able to identify those biases within yourself, which takes a lot of self-reflection and willingness to, to look at yourself deeply. When we're considering these diversity factors, if you will, quote unquote, part of aging in America often includes significant financial concern um, because of the way that systems are playing out with social security and rent controlled environments or uh, concerns about long term care, things like that. How do you integrate that in therapy? How do you see mental health professionals fitting into that, you know, to, I guess, shift potentially from the therapy line of thinking to a case management line of thinking? Yes. So this is a great question that I don't know that I have the best answer for. I will say um, Medicare. So when you're over 65 or qualify for Medicare, that can be helpful in terms of helping you to older adults to access mental health care. Not all therapists take Medicare. So that's something to consider. One of the, I will say that there are some barriers to therapists in, in terms of even providing services for older adults. So no wonder older adults aren't getting the care. Some of the barriers are like, if you don't take Medicare, you have to opt out. You have to go through an extra step of if you're self-pay only and you're a therapist, you have to go through an extra step of opting out of Medicare, even if you don't ever plan, you know, even if you're, you're always going to be self-pay, you still have to tell Medicare, hey, I'm doing self-pay only <laughs> if you're going to see somebody who qualifies for Medicare. So if you're going to see somebody 65 and older, you have to opt out with Medicare if you're self-pay only. And you, you have to, to my understanding have the older adult, the person who's 65 and older, sign a consent that says that they understand they can't file a claim for Medicare for any super bill that you might provide for them. And that, and so there are, there's more red tape, which is 
you know, hard on therapists because oftentimes we're running our own show and we're busy and pulled in a million different directions. And so there's extra paperwork to to do. There's extra consent documents. There's extra discussion about payment, which is uncomfortable. And so that's a barrier for therapists doing this work with older adults. But in terms of access, so right now, I think it's a good question, Beth, but I don't know that I have the best answer. I will say right now, older adults who are getting mental health care are largely getting mental health care in primary care. So they're maybe getting an antidepressant in primary care and on their way. The majority of older adults, of course, we know 67% are not getting any mental health care, but even of the people who are, it's largely within primary care systems and largely then beyond that in in, um, like hospital-based medical systems. So my... My goal is to improve this because I think as as baby boomers age, baby boomers want more choice in healthcare and options, are also more familiar with mental health than the um, previous generations. And um, and so my hope is that so I'm trying to build a national provider directory of geriatric mental health providers who can actually help older adults who are not necessarily based in big medical systems but can do like telehealth, you know, across uh, like if in your state or something. Well, it's also those considerations when we're thinking about finances and even just access to buildings. Do we have elevators? Do we um, offer, like you said, telehealth when there are considerations about transportation? Because many folks may choose or not be able to drive any longer. So what are we doing as a society? And, and I think that's part of the complexity even in that question is that some of these things are individual practice factors that clinicians need to be considering, but also then zooming out the systemic factors that are at play that are impacting someone's access to care that um, and that's where the activism comes in. But so I, I'm I'm glad that we touched upon that idea and how all these factors are culminating to the phenomenon that you see now in terms of access to care. Um, Regina, there are so many more questions that I could ask you, obviously, about this. Um, and we're out of time for today. For people who are listening and this really um, was a way for them to wet their palate in consideration of ageism and how that shows up. Um, for individuals who are older adults, but also in the clinical setting, where do you recommend they get additional training and start to really um, make their experience in this area more robust? Yeah, that's a great question. Training is key. Where I was undertrained, and I even had a a rotation in hospice. I was undertrained around working with older adults with mental health concerns. Um, there is a great. I'm. I am working on um, becoming a CE provider. My Center for Mental Health and Aging is working on becoming a CE provider um, for mental health and aging sort of topics. Um, there's another place. I want to look it up. It's out of Rush, the Rush University Center on Aging. I think has an E4. Center for Excellence for Behavioral Health Disparities in Aging offers lots of great training. And I and they have a huge grant from SAMHSA. And I think their grant allows them to provide continuing education for free. And they have some of the leaders in the field in geriatric mental health providing training. And so that's e4center.org. And you can find training resources. SAMHSA also has a really great fact sheets and guides for clinicians. The National Institute on Aging has lots of great guides as well, like um, an evidence-based practice guide related to depression for older adults, uh, great guides for substance use and aging, some great fact sheets, which measures you can use just easily in your clinical practice. Um, there are lots of uh, copyright-free measures that clinicians can be using, even to um, just assess for depression. So PHQ-9, which I think you've probably talked about on here, is um, is normed with older adults, so that's okay to use with older adults. And then there's another called the geriatric depression scale, which is just a yes or no, so it's a binary sort of measure, which if the person is overwhelmed with answering PHQ-9 or... Um, uh, or even has dementia. I've had good success using the geriatric depression scale with people with dementia. 
And um, but so the E4 Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health Disparities and Aging could be a great place to get more training and education as well. I also have a podcast where I interview experts and I talk a lot about uh, geriatric mental health. That's the psychology of aging. That's on like all the podcast platforms. It's free. Um, I talk about like interview people who are experts in suicide and aging and dementia, um, anxiety, substance use, all sorts of topics related to older adults, uh, family caregiving. Wonderful, Dr. Kep. Thank you for all of the resources. And for folks who are listening and want to learn more about you and your work, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, so you can go to mentalhealthandaging.com. That's the Center for Mental Health and Aging. You can get lots of resources there. I have some fact sheets. And then you can, there's a contact form and people can contact me there if they want. Wonderful. And for those listening, again, Dr. Regina Kep, her last name is spelled K-O-E-P-P if you want to Google her. And um, Regina, thank you for spending this time with us. I mean, I think there's so much, obviously so much more that we can be discussing, but I think you planted some seeds. I know for me, the research that you shared was very helpful in clarifying these considerations for clinicians. So so thank you. Um, Before we go, is there anything else that you want to leave our listeners with about like this idea of ageism and, and the impact on mental health? If we are reinforcing ageist beliefs, we're discriminating against our own future selves, one. And and two, there is so much richness in the relationships and the history and the wisdom and lived experience that it can be so powerful. When I work with people closer to my age, boundaries become so much more front of mind in terms of relationship boundaries. When I work with older adults, boundaries feel more inherent already in the interaction. We're at different stages of life. We're at, you know, we have different peer groups. We have all sorts of differences. It's so, I love that there's freedom in the relationship because there are clear boundaries. And so I feel so much more authentic in terms of I can be myself. I can learn about who they are. I, I just find it to be so valuable. So I hope that the listeners will find value in working with older adults too. Wonderful. Thank you again, Regina, for joining us. I appreciate it. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.